Well, welcome to Talks at Google, our virtual event. I'm Dr. Karen DeSalvo, the Chief Health Officer here at Google. The topic today is one that I have been spending quite a lot of time on and one I know many people are thinking about, the COVID pandemic. Everybody has been through so much. It's been a trying time, a dynamic time, and also a time of really incredible scientific advancement and a time when we've learned a lot about ourselves as humans and as humanity. But we may be um, on the road to our new normal and post-pandemic times for many in the world might be on the horizon in 2022. Our guest today is someone who's been helping people around the world get through the pandemic. It's Dr. Sanjay Gupta, and I'm really delighted to host him today to share his thoughts and wisdom. Like many, I'm a big fan of his work. Um, he is the CNN chief medical correspondent, but of course he wears many other hats. For example, in addition to his role on CNN, he's also the host of two podcasts, Coronavirus, Fact versus Fiction, and Chasing Life. He's also associate professor of neurosurgery at the Emory University School of Medicine. And lest I forget, uh, he is also still a practicing neurosurgeon. The reason he's here today is to talk about his latest book. I think this is his fifth, World War C, Lessons from the COVID-19 Pandemic and How to Prepare for the Next One. Throughout our conversation, please feel free to add your questions to the live chat, which is on the right side of the screen. We'd love to get as many audience questions as possible for Dr. Gupta. And let me welcome now our guest, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for that kind introduction. We're really excited to have the conversation with you today. So um, I very much enjoyed this book, and I think there was so much in it that um, resonated with me as a physician. Uh, lots of, of stories that you told um, from that resonate between the way we think about root cause and really understanding uh, in the world of medicine how to be honest with ourselves um, about what might be going right and, and what might be uh, going wrong in, in the world. It's uh, The book is full of this this um, mastering hope and honesty, something that you talk about in the book. So I wanna start with something that's really um, top of mind for many of us here at Google, which is about getting the right information at the right time to save lives. Um, we spent a lot of time during the pandemic working to amplify the important messages of public health, but it's such a big challenge you know, when to communicate, how to, um, how often, so you don't, people don't get fatigued. So I was hoping that um, wearing your hats as doctor and journalist, that you could talk to us about how you have learned to better communicate or what you think we should know as a company, but also as a world um, and in this sort of rapidly changing landscape about the pandemic um, of COVID-19. Well, um, that is, a, that is a, a topic that's really been at the top of mind, I think, for some time. And even you know, after 20 years of sort of living at this, this uh, inflection point between medicine and, and journalism, I've learned a lot over, over the past couple of years about that, that exact topic, Karen. Uh, you know, I, I think that there, there's always these parallels, I think, between my, my work as a doctor and my work as a journalist. In, in what you just said. I mean, when, when we're taking care of patients, we of course wanna be hopeful um, and provide information that is hopeful, but I think our primary purpose is to, to be honest about what's going on and to then uh, help formulate a plan based on that honesty. It's easier sometimes to, to, to over, to sort of sugarcoat some of the things that are happening gloss over them, not give them as much attention, because that is obviously what people want to hear. That's what I would want to hear if I were a patient. And when it came to this pandemic, I think what everybody wants to hear is that this is not as big a deal as we think it is, uh, as public health experts were sort of concerned that it would become. So I think for, for me, the, the, the lessons here uh, were to always lean into the the, the honesty, do it with compassion, do it with empathy, and be humble about certainty. One thing that I think also became clear to me, and maybe this is something you've noticed as well, Karen, I think when it comes to science and scientists, and I would put doctors and clinicians in that category as well, people often say, well, 
a scientist said that, and that's equated to 100% certainty. Mm -hmm. People expect science to be like math. Two plus two always equals four. And it's hardly ever that way. And especially when you're dealing with something that is truly novel that we're all learning about together. So when you're not certain, um, frame that uncertainty in some ways for people. Um, when somebody says, this is what you should do, if the next question the person asks, well, how certain are you uh, of that plan of action? Have, have, have a, a way of thinking about that, have a way of representing that. I'll just tell you quickly, I interviewed a professional poker player uh, who is also a psychologist for the book. And, and the reason that I interviewed her, her name is Maria Konnikova, and uh, she, she's written a great book as well that people should, should read. But it, it, it struck me that when you're playing poker, fundamentally what you're being asked to do is bet on uncertainty. Uh, you have to bet on uncertainty, which I think is just fundamentally a really interesting concept. I, I guess maybe it's intuitive, mm -hmm. but when she was talking about this in, in her own sort of learnings, she said that this has been a concept that existed long before games like poker and people like Kant, the philosopher, would talk about this, and he talked about it in the context of doctors and patients. Patient goes to the doctor, doctor says, this is what you have, and patient says, how certain are you? Are you willing to bet $10 on that? Are you willing to bet $100? Are you willing to bet $1,000? Are you willing to bet your happiness? How certain are you of that? And some people may, may sort of display certainty at the same level when they're 70% certain as another person at 99% certain. So I think the idea of science not always being certain, but being able to frame that uncertainty is a really important part of communication. Because if you're humble about that in the beginning, it, it, it helps avoid a lot of the, the misgivings people may have about that scientific uh, guidance later on. There's a lot of really important words that that I think have important in the way that we typically do business in medicine and science, things like humility and uncertainty. It's it's not always the front the front foot that we have, right? And I think often, especially in the scientific enterprise, uh, randomized control trials um, happen behind the scenes, and then there's a regulatory process uh, where, where the science is evaluated. Typically, those meetings nobody even knows they're happening and. Right. They're not on public display where tens of thousands of people are paying attention in the moment, much less than being on the above the fold front page of, of the paper, on, you know, even in the evening when, when after the meeting has occurred. I mean, the FDA's right. um, proceedings have been really um, in, the, in the sort of popular culture, essentially. So have the CDC's decisions. And I think for a lot of people that that has created a level of uncertainty because they I, I don't think that the average person understood the rigor, but also the many steps. And it's one of the, the things that I think is exciting to me about coming about the pandemic is the learnings, not only about COVID, but about how we build an evidence base in medicine through the scientific uh, efforts and, and, and really strive to move away from uncertainty. But yes, it's been a very uh, difficult time to have to message to the public or even to our individual patients about things where uh, we have most of the information and we, can, and we can move forward and then also to change course. So maybe a follow on for you about uh, lessons that you've learned uh, as we've had to change the way that we talk to the public uh, about the COVID pandemic when you have to say, we thought that it was A and actually it turns out to be B um, and, and how you keep people's um, trust in, in that kind of a, of a conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that 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 last point is is a really is a really fundamental one, and it and it does get at this this idea of the humility up front to to always be able to say, look, we are we are all learning together, and things may change as we learn more. Uh, I think there's been a hesitancy sometimes uh, among the scientific and medical community to frame things that way because. It, some some would say, look, if you frame it that way, then people aren't going to really um, listen to you uh, and follow your 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 guidance as closely because you're just saying, hey, look, this could change. So, what confidence do I have in following this? On the other hand, it's the truth that things could change. So, I think there's there's two things that sort of jump out at me. One is that if you're going to err in a situation like this. You, you probably want to err on the side of, of being careful uh, as opposed to, to, to not. It, it's kind of like if you're going around the blind turn in a car, 
most people would sort of pump the brakes a little bit as opposed to accelerating around the blind turn, if, that, if that's a metaphor that makes sense to people. But I think you also have to recognize, and again, I'm, I'm speaking uh, after you know two years of sort of really being so immersed and head down in this and thinking not just about the vaccine and the virus and everything, but this communication issue. You have to anticipate that with the same objective information, people can have very subjective interpretations. So for example, I remember that I was on this call with a bunch of school superintendents uh, last year sometime, and uh, the question came up sort of what is the, you know, across the board mortality potentially with this virus? And at the time, you know, looking at the data, it looked like it was around 0.5%. And, and uh, you know, to give context, you know, flu is around 0.1%. So this was five times deadlier than flu, for example. And so, you know, 0.5%. And I remember watching the faces on the screen and there were some people who said, my goodness, 0.5% mortality. That's really scary. I mean, so you're telling me one in 200 people will die. We better be careful. You know, we better do things to protect ourselves. And there were other faces on the screen that were basically saying, so you're saying I'm 99.5% good. What's the big fuss here? What's the big concern? Same objective data, different subjective interpretations. And I think, you know, it, it would be easy to say as a scientist, hey, look, I've given you the data. Make of it what you will. But I think that's a little bit, uh, it's, a, it's, it's missing a very important step. I mean, if you're, if you're serious about trying to convey something the data is one thing, but I think the context is important as well. As soon as I say one in 200 people will die, even people who heard the objective 99.5% survival, they, they were like, wait a second. Okay, I come from a town of 4,000 people, so 20 people in my town would die of this. Huh. It, 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 you know, the framing yeah. uh, can change. And I'm not saying that, to, that you want to necessarily, unnecessarily frighten people or, or editorialize objective data, but I think it's important to always provide the context as well as the data for things. Fair, you know, absolutely. And um, I think sort of typically when someone's making a risk calculation for themselves about whether it's an infectious disease or a chronic disease or a treatment, they're often doing that one-on-one -on -one with their clinician, with their, do right. their doc. We've had to communicate at scale throughout this pandemic. And so people are making these, these trade-offs um, for themselves without a lot of support and coaching. And um, I think we've all seen as people have come down to that moment of should I get the vaccine and when, they're, they are turning to a person next to them, you know, hopefully their doctor, hopefully a, a care provider, but it could be a neighbor, a pastor, or someone they, that they trust to try to help them work through that risk calculation. You talk in the book about there are even some tools that have been developed, some app tools like by Hopkins that, that allow for people to do that individual risk calculation. I wanna ask you about the flip side though of communication. If we aren't there with them in the room or in the moment to help, mm. to help, coach, help them coach and navigate and they're interpreting information and data. I mean, there's been so much publication of information like in preprints, for example, where the world has had access without really understanding sometimes the underlying structure or methodology of the research or how to interpret it or apply it to their own risk. You talk a lot about um, myths and misinformation, and I think you mostly call it disinformation in the book. Would love to hear your reflections on how you think that has played out in the pandemic and what we've learned or should have learned and, and how we might think going forward about not only addressing that for COVID, but, but in other important areas where we need to attend to people's health. You know, like you, I, I, I'm a fan of, of information. You know, we are in this information age. And I think the idea of, of regulating it in a way that decreases information, I, I, my own, this is my own personal belief, but I'm not sure that that's, that's, that's the, the right approach. I mean, you know, I think, you know, this democratizing of information, I think, has tremendous value. But I have been surprised, I think, um, by how much both mis and disinformation there has been. And I and the distinction for me, I think a little bit is misinformation, I think is 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 always been there and mm -hmm. disinformation to some extent, but disinformation is strategically bad information, whereas misinformation is just bad information. And I think um, 
you know, I, I, I've not felt more vulnerable with regard to disinformation than I think I have through through this pandemic. And what is what is jarring, I think, at times is that you know you you, you don't you don't have a sense of what the motivation sometimes is. Mm -hmm. uh, is it just to create chaos? Is it just to sow doubt? Like, what is the purpose? You, I think, as especially as docs, maybe you think, well, what, you know, what's the motivation? I understand the root cause here. It'll help me solve the problem. But I think it's sometimes hard to ferret out um, the sources and the motivations of some of this disinformation. I think that the the, the, By the key way, I that I and I just wanted to put, I want to put a pin in that. The disinformation has intention behind it. And that's yes. partially why it's so much more dangerous. Yeah, right, right. And even if you don't necessarily understand the motivation for that intent, it's there and it's strategic and it's coordinated and it's remarkable. And, you know, I mean, even before the pandemic, uh, there were, you may remember, Karen, there was these measles outbreaks that occurred mm -hmm. uh, in New York, where I am, um, you know, Southern California, uh, Minnesota. And there was, you know, it was, it was, they were significant. They're obviously nothing like what we've gone through with this pandemic, but they were significant because these were totally preventable cases of measles. And at that time, it was also, it was political in the sense that uh, there were certain groups of people who were more likely to not, in that case, be vaccinating their children. But what was so striking to me as we dug into that was that they were often targeted. They were often targeted with strategic disinformation campaigns. They would receive flyers, they'd receive, you know, messages in their email, whatever it may be. Um, and and it's th those those sort of groups of, of disinformation ambassadors, if you will, uh, grew and grew and grew. Um, again, it, it would be really interesting and worthwhile maybe trying to figure out the motivation behind that, but that was happening. And we see the same sort of thing now, I, I think, through through the COVID pandemic. I think for, for, for me, there's two lessons that have come out. One is that you have to make sure that there's plenty of good information out there as well. I think, um, I don't know, you could probably tell me better than anyone, but trying to take down all the bad information is a hard thing to do. It just seems really challenging. You can, you can search for anything and get confirmation bias pretty quickly if you wanted to, uh, depending on how much you search. Um, but making sure there's plenty of good information um, is, I think, re really critical. But it's, also, a really, just, it's a really important way that we think of providing that counterweight. So completely agree. You do want to find the harmful misinformation. On the other hand, you want the first thing that folks can access to be that quality information from the CDC or American Academy of Pediatrics or, or, or whomever. Yeah, I think I remember even, again, pre-pandemic, um, if I was on Google and I searched for something like vaccines and autism, I think I remember there would be these boxes that would pop up. Mm -hmm. So you may find a bunch of studies that say, yeah, oh yeah, vaccines can relate it to autism, but then you'd find a really important box there as well that would say, hey, the, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, according to the CDC, and I just think that that's, that's a really smart strategy so that people will see that. I mean, as opposed to saying, hey, we've, we've taken down all the bad information. I don't know, in, in an information age, if you believe that an information age is valuable, which I do, um, then I think you, you, the counterweight seems, uh, to me at least, a far more effective strategy than trying to just play whack-a-mole. The second thing I will just say quickly, and this is something that I've, I've tried to do more of myself, is, you know, if, you're, if I'm doing pieces for CNN or if I'm doing pieces for 60 Minutes or whatever, or I know that there's a certain audience that's, that's going to watch that. I do know that. And, and for the most part and I mean this in the best possible way, they probably already have a similar point of view to, to what I'm saying. They're not coming in necessarily to be challenged, um, which, which makes it sort of imperative for someone like me and for lots of others to go and talk in places or communicate in places where it's not as much of a echo chamber, if you will. Uh, places that are a little less comfortable, where places, they're not getting the message. It's not that they're malicious, malignant. They're we live in these siloed worlds. Mm -hmm. And so being able to bridge those gaps in a way that is meaningful, I think is really important. I'm just one person, but I think to the extent that we can institutionalize this, as you say, reach people where they are, right person, right time, right place, 
I think is 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 really important. And I hope that's one of the big lessons that comes out of this pandemic, because disinformation spread as fast as the virus did at times. And I think it was equally harmful. We, we learned a lot um, more in this pandemic, especially about health information communication and the, the, the role of the messenger, which is aligned with what you're saying also, is that sometimes the messenger is speaking to its echo chamber. And, and um, what, what you need to find is how to either uh, broaden that and or um, to find a way that you can reach messengers for, or, uh, for other audiences, YouTube being a platform yep. where we've been able to do that. I think the reality is also, I'm sure you're, you're experiencing the same thing and hearing it from your uh, medical colleagues like I am, uh, that very often it's that one-on-one -on -one conversation at the bedside or in the clinic um, that is going to either help people understand or change their minds and vaccines being such an important uh, era that we're in right now. And um, we, you, you write a lot. You have, I know you've uh, publicly done a lot of uh, myth, bust, myth busting conversations with people who have very different points of view and um, and and in the book provide some coaching and suggestions on, on how to have these conversations. I think um, uh, I, I want to make sure we get to other parts of the book, so uh, especially pandemic proofing. But maybe you could just give us a snapshot of like one of the myths that um, you find hard to believe that it's been out there, and and sort of some of the tactics that you've taken to try to help people understand um, what you know, sort of what. Um, um, what kind of conversations or, or language that they should that they should have with people that have maybe have a different point of view? Well, I, I think the um, the some of the myths around the vaccines have been particularly frustrating in, in part because you know I think the the vaccines uh, if you're a scientist and you're someone who follows these things you you, you realize that this really was an extraordinary scientific achievement. I mean, I would have these scientists who are these very humble, soft-spoken, non-hyperbolic people who would call me up and, you know, very hushed tones on the phone and say, Sanjay, this, this was our moonshot, you know? And I'll be like, ah, that's audacious. Moonshot, really? You have no idea. This, the, I mean, there were so many people who thought that we couldn't, wouldn't possibly have a vaccine by now. Mm -hmm. The quickest it had ever happened was four years. And so I think to have seen the vaccines then be portrayed as these devices that may carry tracking, you know, uh, chips and things like that and causing, you know, more dangerous than the disease itself. It's, it's, it's hard to hear, you know, I think. Um, uh, I, and I think it comes from a place of deep mistrust mm -hmm. of pharma, of large institutions, of the media. Of, of government as soon as mandates were, were floated. Uh, there was an increasing backlash in, in many sectors uh, against government that may have been mandating these vaccines. So, you know, I think that's, that's, that's been surprising to some extent, Karen. I, I you know, as, as a science fiction sort of kid, uh, I always thought, you know, the, the, the one thing that sort of galvanizes all humans on planet Earth would be an alien invasion. Right? How can we get all come together because it's an alien invasion and that's it's going to be this, this huge moment of solidarity. And the virus in some ways was like an alien invader. It was this totally novel, different type of virus. And, and we, we, we sort of fractured um, along all these different lines. And um, it was, I think it, it was heartbreaking at times to, to sort of watch. But I think the, the myths around the vaccines were, were, were very challenging. Having said that, I'm, I, I really, I, I, I talk about this in the book, but I, I say you have to share, not shame. Shaming people about vaccine hesitancy is, is a bad idea, mainly because it doesn't work. I mean, you're not, you're not going to convince somebody to get the vaccine by shaming them. It, that's just, that's human psychology. If anything, you may, you may sort of fortify their beliefs against not getting the vaccine. And I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, it was just um, a couple months ago. So well into, you know, the release of the vaccines, I was at my house one day, my air conditioning unit had, had broken. And so an air conditioning repairman came over to the house and, and he's probably in his mid seventies, very nice guy, wore a mask, you know, was fixing the air conditioning. I had no idea if he knew who I was or not, you know, didn't matter. As he was leaving, he, he says to me, um, Hey, do you mind if I ask you a question? 
And I, you know, at this point I realized that he knew who I was and he said, should I get the vaccine? Hmm. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, of course you should get the vaccine. You know, he says, the reason I ask is because I have a stent, a, you know, a, a thing in one of the blood vessels in my leg. And I heard something about the, the vaccine causing blood clots and I didn't want it to, to block off my stent. I said, okay, well, very fair question. So, you know, here's the thing that, yeah, you're right. There was some about that. It was mainly in postmenopausal women. It was mostly Johnson and Johnson vaccine. You should know that the risk of blood clotting with COVID is about 80 times higher than the risk of potential blood clot with the vaccine. He was thankful. Well, you know, I've been trying to call my doctor. I, you know, I, I, no one had told me that. Now I know. By the way, he says to me, my daughter, his daughter, died of COVID the week before, and she, before she was on, put on the ventilator, she asked him, begged him to go get vaccinated. So he really wanted to get vaccinated, and it was heartbreaking, you know, to hear about his daughter but he was worried about this clotting issue. And it's, it's a long story to, to basically tell you that, first of all, it was, there, there are people out there who still have legitimate questions and concerns about the vaccine, even after a year of the vaccines or 10 months of the vaccines being out. Uh, not everyone is hearing this information. They're just not. We think that they are, but they're not. And, and our healthcare system, Karen, you know, as you and I both know, can sometimes be very difficult to navigate. Yes. I mean, how do they get access to Karen DeSalvo to be able to ask a question like that? How do they do that? It, it, it's, it's challenging. And how do they then trust that the person they're hearing from is a person of the caliber of a Karen DeSalvo that's giving them good information? Everything got politicized, even medical information. But there's people out there who they don't care about that at all. They just want to make sure that they're doing right by their own bodies. Such an incredible story. And I think um, um, so uh, wonderful that he found someone he could trust literally by going to your house. And you're exactly right. I think we coming out of this pandemic, we in the medical profession need to do a better job of seeing that we're available and that we can be this sort of continually trusted resource and or that we're thinking that it doesn't have to be the doctor. This is something I learned doing community health. Sometimes in, in our in our clinical staff, it was the community health worker yeah. who was the most trusted person because they came from community. But if we could... Um, give them, give that community health worker the tools and information that they needed, they could help the people who who really trusted trusted them the most. So I think being open to, to those relationships. I want to um, start to transition um, into talking about the, 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 the way you're helping us think about the next chapter about being pandemic proof. You have this great um, uh, way that you uh, use the, the letters of the word proof to help us remember the things that we should do for ourselves, for our community, for the health of the institutions that support us uh, to get prepared because COVID will not be the last. Um, uh, hopefully we'll get a long break to build up in between, uh, but we have a lot of work to do to see that we're pandemic proofing our, ourselves, our bodies, our families, our communities, and our institutions. So could I get you to walk this, this uh, the people listening here, just through the the, the various, the, the, I'm, I'm gonna mess up the number of areas, the five areas, and then um, we can have some follow on questions and some of the, the particular uh, comments that you made in those. Sure, I'll, I'll tell you what they stand for really quickly and then I'll just touch on a couple of them more, more specifically. This is, but, your, this is your test. Yes, I know, right? I, it's, it's hard. <laughs> my, my mind is I'm foggy like I think a lot of people's are, um, but it's proof. So P is for plan ahead. And, and that's a big one that I'll come back to in a second. R is for reorganizing how you think about risk. Um, that, this is something that even pre-pandemic is something that most, most of us aren't particularly good at. We, we spend a lot of time doing far riskier things than we realize, and they get very concerned about things that are not nearly as risky. O is about optimizing health. And a, another big one My that I don't think got enough attention. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, this, this gets back a little bit into the idea of being able to have a nuanced conversation about the fact that we are not a very healthy society in the United States. About 42% of the country is obese, and obesity was a significant risk factor for more severe outcomes with COVID. I mean, we typically think of optimizing health as, as something that we do so we prevent heart disease 20, 30 years down the road. But I think if anything, this pandemic showed us just how acutely uh, some of these risk factors can be now for, for, for more severe outcomes. O is for organizing family. I mean, you, you have an idea of how you feel about things. Um, pull the kids out of school or not. Parents going to go into a long-term care facility or not. 
you may have your own ideas on these things, but we, we don't probably really ever sit down and talk to the family members who, whose lives would be really affected by this or hard conversations to have. Mm -hmm. But we have to do those things. And, you know, the pandemic is a reminder of that. And then F is, is really fight for the future, you know, of, of uh, avoiding these types of pandemics, which I think is really quite possible. Plan ahead, I'll just tell you, you know, I, I think this is almost the philosophical change. We have thought about these viral outbreaks, possible pandemics, more like weather events, like a hurricane. They're just going to come. You got to shelter in place, survey the damage after it passes. And, you know, that, that's how you deal with it. And the idea that we could treat this much more proactively, find these viruses as they're making the jump from animals to humans, trying to prevent those jumps as much as possible, working on universal vaccines so that we don't have to sit there and, and do it in the moment, but we have more universal platforms, uh, understanding what it means to pump the brakes around these blind turns. So maybe quickly going to masking, for example, at least for a period of time until we can assess what exactly this, this virus, this new virus may be all about. Um, that planning ahead, I think, just needs to be codified. If we put in the way that we think about defense, the Department of Defense, we spend a ton of money every year to basically defend ourselves against potential threats. We don't have to litigate each of these decisions in the face of a potential threat. DOD exists to do that. Pandemics are, they're a threat. They may be a natural threat, but they are a threat. And if we can just codify a lot of these things ahead of time so that we don't have to negotiate every decision, let them become subjected to politicalization, which is inevitable, I think it goes a long way. And you know just what, George you, W. Oh, I was, I was just about to ask you to talk about that. The ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So yes, please talk about the plan. Yeah. I mean, you know, George W. Bush back in 2004 read the book, The Great Influenza, John Barry's book. And book. He, was so, he was so affected by it that he immediately said, we need a pandemic preparedness plan. This was a couple of years into the war on terror, just to give you an idea where the country was at that time. So he's talking to Fran Townsend and Fran Townsend was like, really? You know, we got, we got other things that we're working on here. And he's like, no, it's that important. And they put together a pandemic preparedness plan and they even put a price tag on it, which was about 30 bucks per citizen. They said, if you spend 30 bucks per citizen, we can essentially become pandemic proof. And that plan existed. They were investing in personal protective equipment vaccine uh, platforms, viral hunters, virus hunters, uh, you know, all over the world, finding these jumps, all the stuff that I just talked about. And then, you know, what happened, Karen, is that we didn't really have a pandemic. There were, you know, and people started to ask, do we need to keep spending this money? It's kind of like, you know, patients, you know, hey, I've been eating right and exercising for 10 years. You know, I mean, nothing's happened. Aren't I good? You know, do I need to keep doing this? Can I go eat some cheeseburgers or whatever it may be? Um, so, you know, it, it's this idea of how do you convince people the value of prevention long term? We have it's, a hard time as individuals. We have a hard time as a society. We, we really do. And, you know, even in that case, you, you, you've reported on on what happened just after that, the 2004 report, um, where I think the number was about $10 billion. And we've ended up spending several trillion. Talk about this in the book. We moved to away from from pandemic preparedness and bioterrorism onto um, natural disaster preparedness because of Katrina. And it's it, I think the taking more of an all hazards approach to preparedness is going right. to be very essential. Though, um, as you as you well describe, we have um, probably the tools that we need from a technological standpoint if we thought globally about how to be more more pandemic proof. Okay, I should keep I should keep you going so we should get on to our. Right. We should move on. We should we, we should move on from 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 plan ahead and go to rethink and rewire your brain. Sure. Yeah. So the rethink and the rewire is is re really more about the risk that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Really, uh, you know, it's it's a good time, maybe not in a moment of crisis to really think about how you evaluate risk. Um, it's it's, again, something we don't consider enough, uh, but that that's important. Uh, oh, optimize health. We talked about. The other O is to organize the family as, as you know, have those conversations about, you know, schools, virtual schools, long-term care facilities. And then F is really the, the fight for the future. And I think one of the things I really focused on in that section of the book was that 
the nature of a pandemic is that we are really all in it together as a world. And we're still dealing with this now um, as, as if we have pockets of the world that are still not protected, for example, against this virus, there is going to be the concern about you know, new, new potential variants that, that could emerge. And even though you may have many parts of the world that are well protected with immunity uh, from the vaccines, um, if new variants emerge that escape that vaccine-induced immunity, that could be a problem. So the fight for all of us is, is, is an important one. And it should have always been, it's, it's always an important one. But um, it, you know, if we think about future potential threats, we've always got to be giving it that global context as well. It's important with information also. Bad information, again, like I said, can travel all over the world very quickly. So I want to spend a minute on this on this idea um, about the global nature of of our planet, how we're all interconnected. You, you do talk a lot about this in the book, and there's a tension, um, a number of tensions in the book. Uh, some of which is about individual versus society. I shouldn't say versus, but how we think about our own risk and society's risks, how we prioritize what what we we need for. Um, our own countries like the U.S. and and also how to to, to balance that um, with with responsibilities um, across the world. I, I very um, much want you to to spend a few minutes talking about. Um, I think what was a really um, certainly for us at Google uh, a very important time when when the Delta wave began to race through India. It was a time when we were just beginning to feel um, that that we could take a breath and start mm -hmm. to think about. I'm um, getting our Googlers back in the office and and think about what we would need to do to for, for post pandemic. And of course, uh, COVID had other plans. Um, and and we, we, like many, leaned in and spent a lot of time uh, working to help uh, the people, uh, people in India. You were on the ground and you have um, family and friends there. And I just uh, I hope that you could share with this audience some of your personal reflections about the global nature of a pandemic, but also of just humanity and, and how we should be thinking going forward about our responsibilities and accountabilities beyond even our own families? Big question. Yeah. There. No, I think, it, but I think it's a, it's such an important question. I mean, you know, I am, um, this was a time when, you know, there was, there was vaccines that had been authorized in the United States. And for, for a period of time, there was um, uh, more demand than there was supply, but that inflection point, it sort of happened. And, you know, you were running into situations now where you were, trying to incentivize people to take the vaccines in the United States through cash rewards, Krispy Kreme donuts, whatever it may be. And in India, at the same time, as the Delta variant started to, to really take hold, um, there was, there was you know, a significant, significant surge of, of cases and, and hospitalizations and, and deaths. And it was, it was pretty, it was pretty heartbreaking to watch in a country that doesn't have nearly the same public health infrastructure, much more densely populated. I think up until that point, a lot of people had been asking themselves, how, how did India not have a more significant wave of disease already considering these, these factors? And there's that, there's another discussion around that, which I'm happy to have, but whatever, whatever was, had happened up until that point, the case at that in, in the spring of 2020 was or 2021 was that there was now a significant uh, a wave of, of cases going around the country. I remember ha having this conversation with my with my dad uh, who who got vaccinated in in December of 2020 along with my mom and. Um, one of one of our very close relatives, uh, one of my uncles, um, became very ill in India, and I still remember it was it was it was so sudden. He was okay on Monday. He got sort of sick on Tuesday. By Tuesday night, he was hospitalized and lucky to get a hospital bed because hospital beds were already becoming hard to find. And he passed away on that Friday, so just three days later. And uh, around the same age as my dad, unvaccinated vaccines weren't available um, to him. There just wasn't the supply of vaccines there yet, and um, it, it was it was it was obviously very difficult. It was just you know it was, it was a very close family member who died, and you know I think for a lot of people who may be listening, um, one in three of us now know somebody who's either had COVID or died of COVID, uh, which is it's a high number. 
-hmm. But I think for those of us who have, it's, it does make it much more, much more real. I mean, I, you know, the anecdotal, I always try and separate out from the data as a scientist, but this, this hit hard and it hit very close to home. Mm -hmm. But I remember, you know, talking to my dad, who's an immigrant from India, and it was just very, very much laid bare that if my dad had still been in India, had not immigrated here, he probably would have likely met a similar fate to my uncle. Similar age, lived in the same place, all of that. And my uncle, had he been here, immigrated to the United States, uh, may have had a similar fate to my dad, been able to get a vaccine and still doing well today. Um, when I was back home and watching the fact that vaccines couldn't be given away in the United States at the same time, people begging for them in countries around the world, uh, it was it was it was pretty. There was a significant significant cognitive dissonance. I think for me, the humanity of it, Karen, as you asked, was was really evident. You saw hospitals overflowing. You saw simple things like oxygen uh, being in short supply. Oxygen of all things being in short supply, and then the vaccines, as I mentioned, um, you know, potentially having if you had availability, having saved so many lives, and then having that hit so close to home all really um, came together for me just as a journalist covering the story so closely. So I, 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 again, I share that as a personal story, but one I think that is emblematic of what a lot of people were dealing with at that time. Yeah, I'm, re I'm, re I'm really sorry for your personal loss and for the loss of so many people. Um, and I, you know, we, we say this in public health that um, no one's safe till everyone is safe. And um, it, it's something that uh, certainly at Google, we've, we've been thinking a lot about vaccine equity. We've been doing work to support Gavi and, and COVAX and, and help get information and technical assistance out to the world. We just, we have a, we have a lot of time ahead of us um, as we move into this um, next chapter of the pandemic where people based on their geography uh, and, and their circumstances will have access to life-saving preventive measures like vaccines and now more more and more therapeutics coming on the market. The news today about a, a new therapeutic from Pfizer, or our children are able to get vaccinated um, here if they're five to 11 in the US. So there's just um, a lot of um, um, opportunities in some parts of the world, but not not in all. And so we, we can't really let our attention shift. I think this is, a, as you describe, something we do sometimes historically as a world and not remember that we're, we're sort of uh, all connected. I think we're going to start to move into audience questions, if that's okay with you, Sanjay. Sure. Yeah. And so we can get some some um, opportunity to, to hear what's on, what's on their mind. And um, I think there's one in here for me in the chat. I think they're going to pull it up on the on the screen as well. These are um, coming uh, through via StreamYard. And um, the question is: uh, Administrative staff at my child's school reference natural immunity as the as a reason that they are not getting the vaccine. What is the current evidence for natural immunity? Yeah, this is a really it's a, it's an important topic, and it's a very provocative issue. Um, First of all, there is there is evidence uh, for the benefits of and the and the strength of natural immunity. Uh, there have been a couple of studies. Um, one came out of Israel, showing that people who had natural immunity, uh, uh, sometimes uh, depending on you know antibody levels and and a, and a couple of other specific factors, could have protection that uh, was equal to or even greater for a period of time as compared to vaccine induced immunity. The, there, there's, there's been a couple of concerns. One is that if you uh, were exposed to the virus early on in the pandemic and have natural immunity from the alpha variant, for example, I think what the data is now showing is that that immunity uh, is not nearly as protective as vaccine-induced immunity against some of the new variants like Delta. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So it does, it does depend a little bit on when your natural immunity is from. Two is that they're finding that about a third of people who have had exposures to COVID really did not generate many antibodies or enough antibodies to be considered neutralizing, to be effective against the virus. Um, it's not entirely clear why that is. Some people have weaker immune systems, uh, and as a result, they don't generate the same amount of antibodies. Uh, they, they tend to respond better to vaccines than they do to a natural infection. Three is that there does seem to be variance in natural immunity based on how significant your illness was. So an older person 
with a really mild infection probably did not generate much in the way of natural immunity or, or you know, infection acquired immunity versus a young person who had a very severe illness. They probably have a much higher degree of infection acquired immunity. I bring up all these factors to basically say this, that it's a very hard thing to really know. Um, most people who say, look, I had it, therefore I have natural immunity, they, they really don't have a, a good, good idea or a good measure of that. Many of the antibody tests out there are not particularly good at actually giving you the, the, the quality of your immunity. They can just tell you if you have antibodies or not, but they don't tell you how, how qualitative those antibodies are. With the vaccines, it's a much clearer benchmark of just how much protection you get. Um, there was a recent study, I'll just end by saying this, that basically showed your chance of reinfection across the board, this is, taking all the scenarios I just mentioned, chance of reinfection with, with an infection acquired immunity, natural immunity versus vaccine acquired immunity was about five times higher. So that was something I think a lot of people paid attention to. Um, again, it's, I, I don't wanna be dismissive of the immunity that people get from having acquired the infection, but there's a lot of variables there and too many variables to base policy on that sort of immunity. And I think that that's why you see a real you know, uh, a real shying away from that uh, when it comes to the CDC and then big public health organizations. I think you mentioned this in our in our conversation earlier that um, getting COVID is quite risky with respect to the complications, including um, uh, long long COVID, which you which you write some about in in your book as well. Yeah, I mean, I I hope it goes without saying that getting the infection is not a strategy yes. for immunity. I mean, I, I think hopefully the people who are asking the question are saying, look, I'm not suggesting anyone go get infected, but if I had been infected, then what is my level of immunity? That's, that's the nuance of all this. And I was really referring to those people. Do not go and get infected to try and acquire immunity. That's a terrible idea. I mean, that's an idea that we've dispensed with long before you know, this pandemic. And people should still get, get and if they've been infected, they should still get vaccinated so that they can be protected in the future. All right, we can probably do this one for an hour, but the next question is, um, uh, you can see that I'm a, I'm an internist, so I love vaccines. Um, the next question um, from, from uh, StreamYard is, can you speak more, some more to the mistrust in the pharma industry that plays into this? Many people I know don't trust the vaccine simply because of how much money is being made by big pharma companies. Yeah, I mean that this this is a this is a bigger question that probably gets out of my 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 specific realm of, of science and, and and actually trying to explain how these vaccines work. I mean there is there is significant distrust and mistrust out there. Um, it existed before these vaccines, um, and you know I'll, I'll take it a step further and say some of it may be warranted. I mean you know th there's there's um, there is a uh, where we live in a healthcare system in the United States where we spend four trillion dollars a year on health care four trillion uh, and we don't have a lot to show for that sometimes in terms of overall outcomes so i can understand why there is some distrust of our healthcare system and 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 pharma as part of that but you, you know i i think that at the end of the day we all have to make decisions uh, for ourselves and, and for our society and even if you account for some of that distrust and the fact that uh, you know um, these vaccines, while they don't cost the individual anything, they're free, um, you know, 20 bucks a shot, probably the federal government is basically paying for that. You add in the boosters, you're talking about 60 bucks per person uh, that is, you know, getting these, these vaccines. It's, it, it is a lot of money. But I think if you, if you consider what we have spent on COVID overall, the, the COVID relief bill, $1.9 trillion dollars, and understand that just economically, if you're if you're base, if you're making this a financial decision, that it is far better for the country to prevent these diseases in the first place. No matter what, it's it's just it's far better to prevent these than to get sick and try and treat it, to get sick and try and test for it, and and the vaccines are just really effective at that. I, I again, I don't want to minimize people's concerns overall, and I think sometimes appropriate uh, skepticism. But with regard to this particular pandemic at this time, I think when I put it all together, the vaccines are still the best bet. 
Well, speaking for all primary care docs everywhere, thanks for talking about prevention, um, especially as a neurosurgeon. We very much appreciate that. <laughs> all right. The next question um, is um, um, Ron Johnson has recently uh, uh, ran a panel on horrible side effects. Why is it so hard to accept that the vac vaccination risk is not zero and people have the right to make informed medical decisions? Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't think anyone is saying the risk is zero. This gets back to that idea of, of certainty. You know, people will say, hey, less, unless you can tell me that this is 100% safe, that there's absolutely no side effects from this, then I'm not going to do it. And I, you know, I often say, and I mean this in, in the most empathetic way, tell me one thing in your life that is 100% safe. And this gets back to risk calculation again, the, 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 the things that we do on a daily basis that, that carry risk and we don't really think about. But when it comes to this particular issue for, for, uh, with the vaccines, we all of a sudden have this bar of certainty with regard to the vaccines that we demand that we don't demand of other things. I, you know, um, yeah, people can have side effects from the vaccines. What I will say is that if you look at overall statistically, the reason that they did the safety trials for the vaccines uh, and, and followed these patients out at least two months is that you find that if you look throughout the history of vaccines, if people are going to have significant side effects, they almost always occur within the first 42 days, the first six or seven weeks. And that is why they, they wanted to follow these people out at least two months. They're following them longer than that, but the authorizations for these vaccines came for some of them uh, after safety data of two months. So what they find is that while people may have side effects that are expected, including sore arm, fever, headache, uh, things like that, you feel miserable for a day, you know, you feel like you have flu-like symptoms, that severe side effects, things like that, the long-term things that people keep wondering about and asking about, um, they're far less likely to occur. They just don't historically have not really occurred beyond that, you know, six or seven week mark. Yes, um, it's been, it, um, I think it's been a really important journey uh, for the scientific world to be able to help people understand how we make vaccines. And I think it's also important for people to recognize, as you say, that we're continuing to track on these um, even after people have been vaccinated in the field. I think yeah. we have time for one more question from StreamYard and then um, time has flown and I, I'm not sure we'll be able to, we'll have to start to close out. The next question um, is uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, by the way, um, Sanjay, does everybody always call you by all three names, uh, Dr. Sanjay? No. And myself doing the same thing. Sanjay, Dr. just Sanjay, yes. <laughs> Dr. Sanjay Gupta, do you think that artificial intelligence and the research in the medical sector could have prevented the wide uh, have prevented widespread uh, um, prevented the widespread of the virus? I think it could have helped a lot. Um, but one of the surprises I think for me, I mean, you know, in terms of using artificial intelligence and, and machine learning, there may be some uh, more inputs into that machine learning after what we've gone through over the past couple of years. And some of those were non-intuitive before the pandemic. So it's true ML that I think is gonna be really great, you know, for trying to predict, you know, how these, these viruses do spread. And even predicting the fact that some viruses may spread completely through people who have no symptoms. Um, that was, a, I think, a bit of a surprise for a lot of people. You typically think they're going to spread through people who are sick, coughing and sneezing and things like that. But I don't know, Karen, and this is maybe uh, beautiful in some ways and, and, and very illuminating, um, but human behavior is, is, is I think, very hard to, to, to predict and to to put into some sort of AI platform at times. We think we can predict that, but I don't know that anyone would have said back, you know, in the fall of 2019, that if I look forward to the fall of 2021, here's exactly how human beings would behave in the midst of this pandemic. That they, you know, could be told that they would be part of a movement that could save tens of thousands of lives if they wore a mask, but some refused to do that. And again, I'm not saying this in a, to try and malign things. I'm trying to say this in a way to understand and maybe try to be predictive of human behavior in the future. I think it's really hard because I think, you know, AI in, in many ways does in some ways 
rely on a certain amount of logic that we are, we expect things to pro progress in a, in a somewhat logical way and things don't it's, it can be chaotic. It can be messy. And as a result, it can be very hard to predict or to program in some ways. So, yeah, I think, I think about this a lot. Um, the, would AI and things like that have been helpful? Yeah, I think they would have been helpful. Could they have prevented it? I, I, I don't think so because there's so many surprises that we've all had along the way. Well, um, those in medicine know that we say uh, patients don't read the textbooks and right. um, the society doesn't really either. And I, I couldn't agree more. So, so, so much of humanity uh, that came forward was so positive in so many ways, so much giving and supporting of uh, neighbors right. who needed help. Uh, there, there's also just been, I think, something, some, some clarity that we have some broken parts of our humanity um, that, that we need to address going forward. And, and I think your book is, um, gives us a lot of food for thought about our personal responsibility, our responsibility to family and, and to, so to society, um, uh, as well as um, keeping us engaged throughout the book with a lot of uh, really important stories that help us understand the motivation and thinking behind many of the people that we saw at the podium every day. So I encourage people um, to check out World War C. I have one last question for you, which we ask all of our guests, Sanjay, which is, um, it's a fun question. So uh, no, no seriousness here. Okay. What is your favorite, what is your favorite Google product? Well, lately and throughout this pandemic really, and maybe even before that, at Google Drive. I, oh. I love Google Drive. I, I, uh, we I use did it, not see that coming. <laughs> I use it all the time, uh, Google Docs and Google Drive, because, you know, we, we, we're constantly collaborating on documents real time. And I've just not found a product that is that is better than that. Not that I'm looking because it works really, really well. Well, that's outstanding. Um, we're, we're glad that you that you've enjoyed the products. I would have definitely thought it would go in a, in a different direction. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, today. And um, thank you, Sanjay, for, for being here and sharing your wisdom. Also, again, like I said, thank you for sharing your book. I will hold up my, my book, which I have and I have read. It's fantastic. Um, th thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for having me.